destruction, a fracas and a fray, a rough and tumble free for all, a broiler ball of Malay, a ruckus to be reckoned with if anyone wants to dare, we're taking the road to the Donner and down to the Donnybrook affair. I will go and I will lead you there. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get going as people continue to file in. Uh, my name is Ben. Welcome, everyone. This is going to be exciting and interesting. It is also going to be our very first one, so be patient with us. Um, and by the way, I want to add, uh, we're gonna, this is become, going to become a regular thing, different events, different exercises on about a monthly interval. So as you have ideas for how we can improve things, both in the process or in the actual delivery of the results, you just let us know. We want to continually improve this process. But I think even this very first attempt is going to be quite exciting. Like I said, my name is Ben. I'll be playing the host and chauffeur today. But what I'd like to do is first go through and give a brief summary of what we're going to be doing. Well, we're going to start off um, with a few instructions for those live attendees who are here, just so that everyone knows anyone who participates in each exercise, that, that is, draws the contours, they will all be invited to attend the live presentation, which Anyone can watch it retrospectively. We're going to post it streaming. But if you attend live, it gives you the chance to ask those questions, those burning questions you have, or even participate in the meeting. So uh, Michael will give some instructions in a minute, and then we'll do introductions of all our super panelists and moderators today. I will do a very brief review of the methods we will using, and then we're going to dig right in there, a structure-by-structure structure review of some very exciting things like 3D ISO agreement or consensus views, some objective metrics of variability, and then a discussion, one structure at a time, where we will be triaging your, uh, the questions that you're asking in the chat bar. So really, before we dig into introductions, Michael, maybe you get, give us some of the rules of engagement here. Absolutely. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining today's panel discussion. Um, we would like to express our sincerest gratitude um, to all of you for contributing your contours for last month's case. Um, the results of this collaboration will have worldwide consequences. So uh, we have participants from over 70 countries, but none of this would be possible without you. So thank you. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees, as you probably know, um, are muted with the webcam off. So no need to adjust your microphone or webcam settings. Um, to communicate with the moderators uh, or ask any questions, uh, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, just type in your question in, in the chat box and we will address it time permitting. And lastly, in the spirit of keeping this collaboration collegial and informal, uh, we will be addressing everyone by first name. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, uh, please use the Q&A chat box um, or for further commentary um, after this podcast, uh, send an email to support at econtour.org. All right, let's begin. All right. Thanks a lot, Michael. Let, let's dig in. Let's figure out who's here today. So we're first going to start with two featured panelists and two featured uh, moderators. So Rachel, why don't you kick it off? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rachel Jimenez. I'm a breast radiation oncologist at Mass General. Um, and um, I'm very interested in contouring and how radiation oncologists contour and think about anatomy. Um, I've been involved with the development of the Rad Comp Atlas, which is uh, a breast atlas for the randomized trial comparing protons to photons in patients with locally advanced breast cancer. Um, and I've also been involved with some initiatives in training and teaching dosimetrists to contour structures. Um, so I'm excited to see what everybody contoured and saw tonight. We can't wait to show you. Thank you so much. Neil. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Neil Tonk. I'm a breast and gynecologic radiation oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, my interest in this and uh, uh, the program, and it's great to be invited, is largely around improving the quality of contouring, especially as we're moving to more volume based uh, uh, treatment. Um, I participate on the RADCOMP uh, clinical trial and also do reviews of all the contours that are done for it. So it's been a wonderful partnership with all the other um, members of that uh, study. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks, Neil. Today's moderators, to keep us all well-behaved and to keep us moving along, we'll start with you, Aaron. I'm Aaron. I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and I, you know, am helping to run this uh, team leader for the C3RO initiative um, and certainly a lot of this has spun out of the eContour website, which 
we started now um, five years ago um, and, you know, want to welcome everybody. And uh, thank you again for contouring and participating actively in this session. Thank you, Aaron and Sushil. Hi, I'm Sushil. Look, uh, I'm a radiation oncologist, used to uh, practice at UPMC, specializing in breast, gynae, and prostate cancer. Recently switched job, but contouring is something which is very near and dear to me. I have published it a lot in that regard, and I have tried to implement that in our own network to, as part of the quality initiative. So I'm excited to be part of the panelist and a moderator here. Most excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, last and probably least, my name's Ben. I'm happy to be here, happy to help. Uh, medical physicist by trade, but I basically invent technology and products for a living. I got my start, um, gosh, almost 25 years ago now in, uh, in the treatment planning industry. And as soon as we started developing, op developing optimization algorithms and doing more and more inverse planning, it just was obvious to me that the contours are the blueprint for everything that we do downstream. And we spend, uh, we've spent so much time working on the optimization routines, the dose calc algorithms, the delivery devices. None of it really means anything if we're not doing the most accurate contouring of targets and organs at risk. So I've been on that soapbox for decades now, and it is just so uh, uh, great to be starting and be part of C3RO. So like I said, I want to just review some of the methods so that as we go through and look at the variation, I want, to, I want you to know in advance, what are we going to be looking at and how did we get it? So these are just simple pictures, not from this month's exercise, obviously, this example just of some parotid. So we, uh, we have a participation, in fact, a growing list of partic participants. It's over 600 now. For this first month, we got about 150 people to fully contour the requested organ. So that's a really good in number. And so we had them do it blindly. So everyone was contouring with the same tool set on the same image set, but of course not seeing each other's contours. We did this with the cloud-based prono technology. So hopefully that makes it convenient that people can do it from home or, or whatnot. Well, we then assembled all those structures. And instead of just looking at a bunch of squiggly lines, which we can do, we also rendered them as three-dimensional consensus grids. So what you're seeing on the screen here is examples of a, a small n, n, n equals about 20, of what that looks like if you view it as this color wash image. It looks kind of like a dose cloud. This is what I call the ISO agreement cloud or the consensus view. So the blue regions represent where a few people thought it was part of the organ. And as it gets closer and closer to red and fully red would be where everyone agreed that every red voxel was part of that particular organ. So it's pretty easy to interpret in that, uh, in, in that regard. And we'll be looking at a lot of those images today. So that'll be a good qualitative look to see where the variation is and the degree of variation. But we do need to put some numbers on this as well. So some of the metrics we'll be looking at today, um, we'll be looking at histograms of absolute volumes. We'll probably kick each structure by structure analysis off just by looking at the histogram of absolute volumes, just as a macroscopic picture. But then we're going to dig in, and I particularly found these two metrics useful. Think of uh, the gradient index that you use for your SBRT cases or your SRS cases. We're going to do something similar, but using the ISO agreement line. So imagine, if you will, if we take the volume where 25% or more of the people agreed was part of that uh, structure, divided by the volume where 75% of the people or more agreed that would represent a ratio. That ratio by definition will always be greater than or equal to one. And it'll give you, the, the larger that number gets, the more variation it was. It means that volume, uh, uh, it, it's, it's really, the gradient is very low and spread out. We can even be more sensitive. And in fact, we'll look at another metric which is the same metric, but the 10% divided by the 90%. Now, uh, so a perfect agreement across all participants would of course be one. So those are some of the other metrics. Everything we look at today and every number we see will be fully exposed in the Prono display case that we will be making available for everyone who participated uh, as soon as this meeting is over. So you can log back into Prono, you'll go to a new workspace called the, 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 the results, and you'll be able to see everything that we're looking at today. Now, I, before we kick off one by one, I thought I'd start to engage our experts here today. And... Um, say, what would you predict? So here are the, the structures and actually the colors that we used for contouring in this exercise. And I'd like to one by one, and I want to include the moderators and the panelists, looking at this list and you know, take a minute to think about it. If you had to pick one structure you think showed the highest inter-observer variation, 
what would it be? And then what structure do you think might show the lowest variation? And if anyone has their guesses, feel free to chime in, but I definitely want to hear everyone's opinions. So I would expect the plexus to have the most inter-observer variation and the heart to have the least. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with uh, Rachel about the, the heart. I think the LED might actually maybe even lower. Um, I think the axilla is going to be quite variable uh, based on multiple different atlases people use and lots of different styles. And if you're a VMAT or proton person or a 3D person, it's going to be, this is interesting though. Yeah, I'd go with, um, well, I think, and I think Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but the smaller the structure, the easier it is to get high variation. So you get the LAD is probably going to have a lot, but the IMNs probably just clinically, um, I would expect. And then I'm also with Rachel though, that the brachial plexus could be all over the place. So let's see. I have a bit of contrarian view on this. I think because I look at contouring in terms of patient impact, dosimetry and coverage, and I feel the biggest impact will be on CTV chest wall. Because that's that's where the variation in terms of con like tangent you put it in or the whatever target you try to cover. So I feel the CTV chest wall would have the highest variation where the dosimetric impact would happen. So that's the way I look at it. And probably if you ask me, the least variation would be probably for the heart. Excellent. I love this group already because you've already brought up two really good points. Let's go in reverse. So that, that's a very good point that Sushil made that when we look at when, when we're looking at the variation, at least in this particular one, we didn't have people submit uh, dosim, uh, you know, plans and dosimetry. I've done and published studies like that, too, where you allow people to vary their contours, you allow them to do a plan and then you overlay gold structures on top of it. That's more of an impact on a DVH or something. We're just going to be looking strictly at the anatomy, but it's a very good point where if something shows high variation, but it's usually out of harm's way, it might not be as a, a sensitive a structure, sensitive to that variation. And then one more step up, uh, Aaron made an excellent point. If we think about what these metrics are, and uh, the smaller the structure, sometimes that can make it leak. You, you can be several millimeters away, but if you're looking at something like a, a small structure, like a, an optic chiasm, you might overlap not at all, which will make your degrees of, of variation be much higher. But that's valuable to know as well, because if you're looking at things like max doses, then the location is pretty much everything that matters. So excellent feedback. So here are, I'm going to give a summary slide of the results, and then I'm going to switch over to Prono. And, and when we look at the summary slide of results, I'll, always, I'll also use that to let, uh, to let the panelists decide what order do you want to attack these in? Because we can totally be flexible. I will be your chauffeur from here on out. But... Without further ado, let's look at the summary slide. So I would say the closest, if we had to give away a coffee card or whatever we're giving away, I'm gonna, I'd give it to Neil on that one because he did say the, uh, the LAD might be. So let me explain, you're seeing these infinities. That means the denominator was zero. So I could have put not a number. That means that in the case of the LAD, there was not a single <laughs> pixel or voxel where where not only that where everyone agreed but that 75 percent of the people agreed now this was out of the full population and for each structure it was over a hundred like i think between 80 and 150 depending on what people had time for it's so a good high end but that means there wasn't a single voxel in the lad where even 75 percent of of uh of people agreed um and that was pretty surprising. And then if we look, we can see the, the 25 to 75 ratio. So I just kind of ordered them from most vari variable to least. And everyone was correct with the heart. And the heart, of course, was a muscle. We'll be looking. It's easy to see. I do hope we have a little time to discuss the heart, though, because I saw some really interesting things about even where the variation was in the heart. So I won't want to get there. So using this slide and kind of getting your breath back in you a little bit. What order do we want to do these in? I'll let, you know what? Let's just, uh, let, let's make this round robin. So Rachel, you get to pick the first structure. You get to pick the first structure. Okay. So um, I'm going to pick the heart first because I think it has the least variability and I am curious to see where the variation is. I'll let the wild, the wild cards go later. 
I love it. Well, you know, what? you're going to warm up. We're going to do a little calisthenics. We're going to stretch out a little bit before we pull a muscle. What I'm showing you here is what every, all the participants see in prono. No one sees each other's, but this is just an example uh, of how it looks. But I'm using this to show you that those participants, Michael and Diana, will flip your, per your permissions so that you will also be able to see the results library. This will be a read-only patient that everyone can go and interact with, Zoom, pan, window level, turn things on and off, and it won't affect the way anyone else sees it. So this will be like a display case. You will not be able to change contours or, or delete anything. But we are now going to dive in, and Rachel wanted to see the heart. So yeah, by far and away, the least variable. So let me show you a little bit how we can, um, how we can use this. Uh, first, let's look is I'm, I said I would kick off every analysis by showing you the, the histogram of volumes. Um, let me kind of go to the middle of the heart. What we're seeing here is the consensus view. So we haven't overlaid the panelist, the today's panelist structures on top of this. We'll do that in a minute. But this is kind of a hot cold map. So you can immediately see in the sagittal and coronal views that there's a lot of agreement. Everyone found the muscle, but when we get sup uh, uh, superior and inferior is where people basically were stopping contouring at different times. So that's something you might wanna uh, comment on. But the first thing I'll show that is also exposed to everyone, if you go to the documents tab on the right, I've put an image that's a histogram of all the volumes. Of course, everything is anonymous, so no one knows whose is whose, except for the brave, panelists here today. So here's the volume of the heart histogram. It's a PNG, so you can just click download and mine will then open in whatever my default program is. So here is the histogram. The minimum contoured was 362 cubic centimeters. The max was 768. And then on the chart, I went ahead and rendered the 25% median and 75%. And um, so even that gives you an idea that Okay, there was some variation. So I'll leave this image around in case uh, any of the physicians want me to pull it up again. But otherwise, we will start diving in. So Rachel, you picked this organ. You, you ask me, what do you want me to do or what observations do you have? Um, so I think what stands out to me is that the inferior portion of the heart, which I would think would be um, encompassed in most people's uh, contour, is missing in about 10% of people. Um, so it looks like the whole inferior portion of the heart is missing as well as some of the posterior portion of the heart. Um, and, you know, I, again, I don't know what people were using if they were using atlases to guide them. Um, but I would say all of the existing um, atlases for breast cancer would have included the entire portion of the heart. So I'm curious as to why it was missing in such a sizable percentage of people. Well, let me, let me make sure we're reading this correctly because this you're inferior, you're talking down here at the bottom of the heart, obviously, right? Right. We did have almost, we had great agreement. So, oh, I should have clarified this. What you're seeing on the screen says gray. It's a percentage. It's a percent agreement. So we really had 98% agreement up until the very bottom. Yeah, the orange is 90%. Yeah, orange is 90%. Red is 100 yeah, so, but I, I think I would have expected 100% agreement when we're covering the myocardium of the heart. It seems like it, ah, was, yeah. it was pretty easy to demarcate. So here's a, we can look kind of, apologize, these, these isodose lines are really iso agreement lines. So we do have a, it's a steep gradient fall off, but yeah, we do have a number of, uh, so, you look, so yeah, you're right about, I'd say, you know, about 10% stopped here. Let me navigate through here. Down here, we have a little bit of disagreement, but otherwise the gradient is pretty, it, relatively tight, at least visually, but there are some differences. A little more using that logic, a little more difference happens here. And, and I think part of the reason why that happened is that the proximal part, which is contoured as heart, is not necessarily heart, but the guidelines say starts from the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. So you know, some people, if they are, you are a purist and you want to really contour heart, then you would not contour the bifurcation pulmonary artery. But to have denominator as a constant number and a constant volume or a, a reproducible volume, and if people follow the guideline, then they'll go by the bifurcation pulmonary artery. But if they go by the pure heart as a contouring, 
then things may change. So I think the difference may reflect the fact that some people are contouring the heart and others are possibly contouring based on the guideline where bifurcation of pulmonary artery is con considered as a denominator. Could we actually scroll up to look at the bifurcation? Because I think Sue Shill's point is a great one. Yeah, tell me if you want me to go up or down. Uh, up a little bit there. So I think, you know, there could be some disagreement about where the bifurcation ends um, and how inferior you'd want to go below it. But if you scroll down, maybe one or two slices. So I would say that's well below the bifurcation, but it seems like there's a lot of disagreement there. That's a great observation over here. The sagittal and coronal show there is this, whenever we see this, what looks like a, a, a not a tight gradient, that's where people are starting to differ in opinion. Yeah, I think there's some data that this is um, sort of a high, a common area of, air, of difference. And certainly we look, think about mean heart doses. So the volume there with like 10% of people contouring, you know, that everything above the orange is variation among at least 10% of people, I guess. So, um, interesting. Yeah, I'll add in a, in, in a good number of the contouring workshops that I've helped with just with the technology part. Uh, it does seem to be that it's a difference in, I think as Sushil mentioned, in, in either the training or the instructions. So what is the quote unquote heart in a radiation oncology sense? And I think that is something that there obviously needs to be consensus to as well before we can even, you know, as a prerequisite to studying the consensus of actual contouring skills. So that's um, area improvement for our industry, I think. While we're on the heart, do you wanna, do we wanna try the LAD? Let's see. Uh... Oh, well, okay. Well, actually let's do, yes, that's a great idea. Um, and we'll let Neil be the captain of that one since he guessed it correctly. But I do want to show people if we want to snap on. So I have all the structures turned off. If I go to the structures tab, we have the two panelists plus Aaron's contour. So I'm going to turn them on, if you don't mind. And I'm going to just go ahead and turn on the heart. They're all the same color. But it does show that the, everyone on this call today, you know, other than half a centimeter here and there at the edges, the there's a very, there's a pretty good consensus. If we just look at the, the three red contours, not a whole lot of difference there. Um, I mean, we could talk about where the edges are and I guess going to have a lot to do with the window levels, which, which I could. So are there any comments here on these, on comparing now the, the, the panelists? I, I mean, overall, it sounds like the, the consensus for the, the heart's quite, quite good. Some of the variables could be the interfaces between the heart and the other mediastinal structures. So, you know, we don't routinely use contrast. We don't necessarily recommend it, um, but using, uh, uh, um, especially with the posterior structures of the heart going say near the esophagus or the interface of even the SVC in the right atrium, I think you're gonna see a lot of variability there. I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised as Sushil and Rachel are much further along in their careers than I am. That, uh, that I'm, I'm able to keep up with that. <laughs> you know, like, but we are, we are still young, just to emphasize on it. <laughs> Forever young. I will I make mean, one... The impor important thing is, like, as we move towards the cardiac substructure, probably this variation will go away. Because then people will contour the substructure the way they see it. I think the biggest issue, which I have noticed in my own experience also, is the proximal part, where people start where left atrium begins, or some people start where they see the bifurcation of the pulmonary vessel. All the RTOG guidelines and study talk about bifurcation and probably some people who are trained in, in that mindset were more proximal than the other people. Keeping the, um, you know, if you try to keep it with apples to apples in a, in a practice for, for the attendees, you can consider working with your dosimetrist to think of a really consistent definition, do some QA it, and then and kind of keep the same people doing it. And that way you have true comparisons and you can understand what the heart doses in between physicians are. If you know you have the same, what you, what you want to determine is your ground truth heart for your practice. That's true. And, and ultimately as a trajectory towards deep learning and AI based auto seg gets better and better. It is, it is on a, an exponential rise. Now, finally, that may be an interesting tool to use to do retrospective studies, to kind of clean up some of the variation out of outcomes analyses. 
Um, Although you do see, I, I mean, I at least struggle. The inferior is usually pretty bad on the AI contouring. So that to mm -hmm. Rachel's point there. But I should mention that some of these extras, actually, we're going to retrospectively see through our, oh, we've talked about a lot about this. These data sets we are going to provide to the AI vendors eventually. We just didn't want them to be at the beginning because the, the, to compare their results versus the panelists and the and the consensus has a lot of value. One thing before we move on, I, if I had to try to pick a consensus percentage or, or an approximate consensus ag agreement percentage that best matched our panelists here, it does seem to be the green, which coincidentally happens to be right about 50%. And this also goes for this, you know, relatively highly, the most variable portion, which is up here at the border superiorly. So that green uh, around 50% looks to be a little bit of a magic number for the heart, which is interesting. Okay, so let's flip it over and um, Neil will have you do the first commentary. Let me switch to uh, the consensus view for the left anterior descending artery. And I will turn all the structures off for now. Whoops. And so let me find this, obviously smaller. And so I think what one comment now, we don't have any red and that's kind of indicated by the fact that we didn't have, we had zero in the denominator. So tell me what to do and what you wanna see and I'll do my best to, to be the chauffeur here. I'm going through axial slices, but we can navigate through here however you want. So it looks like there's somewhere between 10 and 30% or 10 and 50% consensus. Uh, in terms of the LED. And I think what, what is heartening is that people are understanding that it is in that interventricular groove and are mindful of that. So that does give uh, uh, some really, I don't know, reassuring feedback. Um, let's take a look at the, the proximal uh, uh, part. So where, where it starts, where, um, where the LED starts, let's go all the way up. And then let's also take a look at where people are, are terminating it. I think what was helpful for this case in the beginning, there were some calcifications in the proximal part of the LED, which you incidentally see. And then we have, and we, I don't know what, you know, what everyone else's practice is, but uh, only if there are very severe calcifications, do we talk to the patient? Most patients will have some kind of benign calcifications at this age. Um, so I think that was a, a really helpful um, structure to understand. So at, at the proximal part, it looks like most people, you know, did kind of roughly did start at the same at the origin of the LAD, went down the interventricular groove. Looks like some people contoured just the vessel versus a space. Um, I'd love to hear what the other panelists think about, about that. Um, we, we typically contour the, the vessel uh, itself and let's go uh, all the way inferiorly. Maybe some interpolation things and then again, vessel versus some you know, contouring the, the space. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Like I'm very impressed by the fact that most, most of them contour the area where LED is. The volume yeah. is variable because of what they did, whether the fat space or vessel. And probably no matter how you contour it, the dosimetric impact of this variation is very minimal because as long as you avoid that area in the breast cancer, you've done the job. So I think even though there is large variation in terms of absolute volume, but the location wise and the position wise, there is significant consistency in the contouring. Well, okay, I, I need, uh, let me break in there. This is blue and yellow. This is, this is, there's very little consistency. We say most people, but we're, we're migrating and looking, say, where do we see the cloud of stuff? But nowhere is the cloud red, orange, or even yellow, meaning probably can the you, peak. I can turn on lower yeah, value. Can you just turn on like, a, yeah. a, you, you know, some 20. Sometimes these are scary. Okay. So I, I'll pre-warn you. I'll put on a, I'll, I'll add a 5%. I'll add a, a 1%. Sometimes you'll see that someone actually was contouring the wrong organ. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's not a small number. So this is a little bit of the, what are we, I mean, here someone was clearly doing the chest wall when they, when they had active the, so that's just a, a human mistake. So uh, the chest wall, you know, yeah, if you select the wrong structure, you get stuck, yeah. you forget to start over. looks like that, that 1% group did, uh, that might be they've, they've, contra they've done the interventricular septum and um, instead may maybe not have understood what, what, the, what the goal was. 
um, it, we see some people going into the the myocardium itself, which would which would not be part of uh, of the LED, whether you contour space or whether you contour the vessel itself. So I would disagree and recommend that that not be done. Um, a good resource, one that we use, is, is Mary Fang's Atlas, um, which is available um, in the Red Journal. So Ben, uh, there is a, a question in the chat, and maybe you can clarify for the for the audience. So the metrics which you're using, is it overlap of the voxel or just the volume? So if somebody has somebody counted five cc but two different areas, will that be counted as a consistent or inconsistent in the metrics? Wonderful question. Yeah. So it would be very inconsistent. So what we what we do is we take all the structures. It's a three dimensional structure contoured in axial planes. Render a volume, high resolution volume, and then we we go through the whole three dimensional volume across every observer, and we bin all the three dimensional voxels. So the voxels are going to be about the size of a CT pixel, and then half of the CT slice spacing. Actually, uh, we rendered all of these, I think, at one millimeter, so pretty highly re resolved. And then, so even if you had similar volumes, that doesn't mean you agreed at all. So, I'll a red voxel would mean all, and in this case, uh, actually, let's get the N value, the LAD here. So I'll, I'll, I'll show the, the distribution of volumes. I forgot to show this histogram. So here it is. These, are these outliers are obviously the ones that someone was contouring something by accident. So uh, really, but the quartiles look right. So they're all, it's a small volume structure, but the N here was 94. So of this, if in this middle green area, probably around 45 to 50 people contoured this middle green area. So it is the peak, but there was so much variation that it was blurred out. It was spread out so that this blue region, now that I have set as two, would be approximately two out of the 94 people contoured. This is the union of all those, if that makes sense. Right. Um, so where they start to overlap is where it will get, it'll get to more towards the red end of the spectrum. So compared to the heart, you did not see an overlap of 75% of the people or 80% of the people. It's exactly right. And that's why that indice, the 25, the ratio of 25% agreement to 75% agreement was inf infinite because there was not a single place in the patient where everyone agreed to even a 75% level where there was an agreement where out of 94, like say 72 people, um, all thought that was it. So people are kind of in the area, but they're not overlapping much, I think is, is a. And I think that, I think that speaks to the challenge in identifying the LAD as Neil had mentioned earlier, particularly if it's a non-contrast scan and a patient doesn't have calcifications. Um, so our practice here has been to try to contour more of the fat space. So rather than just contouring the LED, contouring the fat space to account for the fact that we may not always be able to see it on every slice, as well as the fact that the heart is beating. And so with such a small structure, um, it's almost like creating a PRV in some way for the LAD. And here's a picture of that. I think, Rachel, if, you, if, you, if I may, here is, I'll toggle on and off Rachel's structure and you can see it is a little more conservative. So it actually encompasses, I think, believe, I believe this is Aaron's, oh, I don't know why that keeps moving slices on me, and, um, and Neil's. So you can kind of toggle them on and off. So they're all kind of, uh, I'd say they're, there's, there's accuracy here, but some precision, not so precise, meaning the overlap region, even of the three, is just, would just be this region here would be the region where all of you agreed. That would be your red region right here. I think an, an important point, I mean, Rachel, you know, uh, Rachel has to tell us about the dose constraints on the LED because that data comes from Harvard um, as well. But, you know, the exact contour here matters a little bit less than generally covering that area in order, because I think, you know, we're some, I think we're often looking at max doses. And so that's why this criticism that like the actual geometric agreement on the LED is, is maybe a little less critical um, just because is it meaningful? Like, you know, is it, does that, does it really, if the, if the dots are like this, you actually, you know, the, the way that radiation dose is distributed, does it make a, a clinical difference? Probably not. Um, but it's helpful to hear your, um, how you contour it, Rachel. Cause I actually, 
as you can see, I'm a little bit smaller on my volume and maybe, um, although honestly, we don't, we don't routinely contour the LED. It's sort of an optional structure. Um, so. Yeah, I, but I think your point is a good one, Erin, because if we're using, again, if we're using 3D, then really all we're doing when we contour the LED is that we're eyeballing where it is and we're adjusting our mm -hmm. angle or, you know, where their MLCs are going to come in and block with, um, with that in mind. So, so you're right. It, as long as people are hitting the general area in which it lies, then they're probably doing what they should be doing in terms of protecting their patients. I think where it becomes yeah. a little bit more um, complex is when you start using VMAT um, or other inverse planning, including proton therapy, because then it really does matter um, where you're identifying your structure, how big it is, and what you're setting your max dose to be. Um, our practice here has really been, when we're using proton therapy, to carve around the LAD and to actually sacrifice chest wall coverage immediately anterior to the LAD as a way to spare dose. Um, but for most people who are not using proton therapy, I think the getting the general gestalt of where it is, is probably sufficient. That's a great, great point. If anything, this is a visual uh, argument for why a PRV is useful, not just for say organ motion or something, but for the, what might be different in the, var in the variability in the contouring, you add a margin to it. If you're more conservative, you're all sparing the same general region. One important thing is for the, as I mentioned before, for breast cancer, it may not matter because you avoid the beam going through it or you carve it out. But you know, the recent data on lung cancer showed V15 of less than 10% to LED predicts for cardiac morbidity and mortality. So now we are looking at DVH now. If you're looking at DVH, then the denominator does matter. So I think if we have, we have to be consistent because we are not only trying to contour the normal tissue based on the disease. We want to contour the normal tissue agonistic of the disease. So when we go to lung cancer and when we say, oh, V15 of less than 10% predicts for cardiac morbidity and mortality, then denominator does matter. So I think we have to come with some consensus in terms of how we define so that we can not only use for breast cancer where we are looking at a maximal dose or trying to avoid that area, say for lung cancer where the avoidance could be harder when we are looking at DVH. It's a really good point. In fact, that's a, it's a great idea for an improvement. For As we progress with these, we can do the sensitivity analysis. Actually, if we had a couple sample plans, maybe a VMAT plan and a proton plan would be really interesting. And we could take those dose clouds superimpose them on everyone's contours and, and look at then at the variation in the DVH. And we would be able to see how sensitive now every patient's going to be different depending on where the target is, but we would get an idea of, of where the actual contouring straight up contouring variation, where it correlates with a DVH change. That's, that's easy to do. We would take a single representative dose and kind of overlay it. And we can get an idea of how those DVH is spread out. We should, we should do that in future months. Very good point. Okay, well, let's keep going around the horn here. I'll, hey, Aaron, I, why don't I, I you? I think Neil is very happy that, again, he's consistent with the two senior people. <laughs> That's right. I'm just trying to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we started routinely contouring substructures mostly for academic purposes. Um, we do it a lot for our lymphoma patients and now for our breast patients. And we've been finding some just awesome data, especially in our comparisons of 3D IMRT and proton planning, since we have all three modalities. Um, we, we, a, a small minority of patients are, are VMAT. We, we typically use a lot less VMAT than we do than you know, some other practices. Um, but Rachel had indicated, you know, you know the volumetric uh, uh, inverse planning really depends on, on your contours and, and you have to really give different weights to things where you, you might not have done before. And especially as your DVH metrics tend towards the, you're trying to minimize the minimum dose or minimize the maximum dose or on a target, maximize the minimum dose. You will see the sensitivity does start to con sensitivity does start to converge with the contouring consensus. Um, because then it becomes sensitive to just, you know, voxels or a millimeter millimeters can make a difference. All right. Well, um, I tried to steer the audience to a target structure, but they are all asking for the brachial plexus. All righty. Well, yeah. so we're, so we're going to let, we're going to do democracy here. So the next one will be the brachial plexus. So I will go and uh, if you bear with me, I'll switch it over the consensus view. I'll zoom out, get, get our bearings straight again.
I think like, the like plexus sun. is going to be unbelievably interesting. Speaking you of know, potential spaces. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, I think it's going to reveal were you a, a head and neck centric trainee or not. <laughs> I think we're going to, you're going to see a similar type of pattern. I'm, I'm trying to get this view so it's useful. And again, feel free, backseat drive. Um, and eventually, as, as people get better and better with Prono, I think we can even have the panelists drive so they don't have to be frustrated with me. Uh, so here is the consensus cloud. Again, we had... The max, here we can look at the maximum, the maximum dose. Oh, by the way, for each of these dose entities, you can go in what we call the scorecard tab. And I've rendered some metrics like what's the total volume covered by, it says one gray, of course, it's by 1% of the people, all the way up to the total volume covered by everyone. So here we have zero. The first, the highest consensus we have is about 75%, a hair above that. And so we did have a 25 to 75 ratio. It's just a huge number, but you can start to see. And then bef before I forget, let me go ahead and show the histogram of the volumes. These are going to be, ex these are exposed to everyone as well. So Neil, I will say, um, yeah, the Hall Atlas is very beautiful and um, probably the ideal brachial plexus, but I have almost, sort of modified my practice based on our auto segmentation that we get um, to be a little bit more of a breast simplified plexus. Um, I don't know if you've, um, if you're so more strict to the hull, you know, like contouring every level that comes out from the spinal. Yeah. Cord. I, so I was, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, I trained, uh, at Memorial where Aaron practices and, and we contoured all levels and all the roots. Um, and, uh, and everyone learned it from, you know, head and neck and some of the thoracic attendings. Um, so that's, that's our practice. And that's what I, I came to know. Um, what's interesting is that there are lots of variations in that practice. Do you contour every root or just the lower ones? Do you contour just the, the, you know, the entire plexus or just the trunks? Um, also, if you look at SPRT atlases, the SPRT atlases do it differently. They say, you know, indicate that contouring the brachial plexus is quite difficult. So you just contour the entire um, uh, vascular conglomeration as your surrogate. And, and you just use the, the vessels as they approach the axilla a, as your plexus and as your avoidance structure. Practically for breast planning, um, so Sheila, Aaron, Rachel, let me, you know, let me know what you think. It doesn't really matter unless you're doing volumetric based planning. And, um, and you're trying to go for a low hot spot or trying not to run a hot spot, um, or you don't need to selectively boost the, uh, the super clav. Um, most, you know, if you can keep your hot spot below 107, definitely below 110 in the superclavicular nodal field, then you should be square in terms of safety. Yeah, I agree, Neil. The only time that I routinely contour the plexus is in a re-irradiation setting. Um, where I'm concerned that I'm going to exceed total tolerance. But otherwise, with the doses we routinely prescribe, it's unlikely to cause a, a plexus injury. Yeah, right. The other situation where I contour other than radiation is if there is a residual node and we're boosting to 60 or 66, grade, then you yeah. want to make sure there is no hot spot there. So I think like routinely in our own practice, we don't contour brachial plexus at all unless we are planning for re-radiation therapy or a nodal boost which where the node is in that location. Yeah, that's exactly our practice is, is exactly the same. We have a, like, we contour it for VMAT, but if we, I've made the pitch for just having a global max, in which case you wouldn't really need to contour it for VMAT, but we don't routinely contour it for 3D and we routinely have, you know, hot spots at the junction or, I mean, relative hot spots. So um, it's an interesting, yeah, how much is this critical? I think re-irradiation to Rachel's point is... Uh, most relevant probably. I can ask a question. Uh, so here we have, if we want, uh, we have a great example of same ballpark, but not much overlap. And this top one would be Aaron and the bottom is Neil. Mm -hmm. Is there like just on slices like this, if you could kind of comment why you put yours there and, and compare to your colleague, is there something to be learned here? Yeah, so I, I, Aaron's right on this one. <laughs> uh, I was being sloppy. So it, <laughs> so you can go back 
um, to the, uh, you can go back to the spine for that. You should be shooting through the middle of the scalenes, whether you, you, um, interpolate through the bone or you stay out of it. Um, ideally you're supposed to stay out of it, but I probably just interpolated through the bone. But this, I mean, this is like the crux of the issue is actually we, even when we do this, sometimes you, you're kind of, I mean, Dave Fuller would say, why are you contouring a brachial plexus without an MRI? <laughs> um, so, you know, yeah, we're taking an ed like relatively educated guess. And um, it's not surprising that in some areas, like, you know, it's not particularly like hugely accurate. I mean, so paying close attention to like to gross disease or re-irradiation cases, I think is I don't know. If the, uh, 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 do you know, Erin? Was was the interslice thickness five millimeter? Because when I was contouring it, I did notice a significant variation in the in the like topography as we went to the neck. Is it two and a half? Yeah, the the slice variation uh, uh, separation is two and a half millimeters. If I go one slice at a time, it increases or decreases by two and a half millimeters. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, one practical way is to contour around the subclavian and the axillary vessel and just follow it through. But uh, you're right, like most people who do breast cancer for a living don't do routinely. And that could reflect why there is so much a variation. If you had an ENT person, a head and neck person doing it, probably the variation would have been less. Yeah, it's like we have the same mm -hmm. idea, but it's slightly yep. off and how be how beneficial. Yeah, how much does this impact patient outcomes? You know, in I, I and well, again, this would be a perfect case where if we had some really aggressive treatment plans to overlay on top, we could say, oh, your DVH would have been, would have looked like this and your DVH would have looked like this. And probably you would have both said, oh, that's perfectly fine. But they probably, they could have been very different all depending on where the dose is. So I do think that's a good perspective we should bring into future sessions is to have one or more high, you know, really aggressive, I think a, a VMAT and a proton example to overlay would be good. Or... Oh, tease the audience a little bit here. Maybe that's something that we, we have all these data, right? So those of you who are interested in doing further research, we have all these structure sets, the consensus grids, and then the image sets. We want C3RO not to be the source of the source of everything, but maybe ideas. And so if you have an idea of some uh, research you want to do, publish a paper, just uh, contact us and we can distribute the raw data to those who, are, who want to uh, help us go further with it. But I think even part of these meetings, looking at some DVH, DVHs would be good. Um, let's take a little, grab your breath here. Cause I think we could do something fun. Michael, let's, let's give some stuff away. So we had a uh, hundred, about 150 of the participants. Thank you all very much for contouring these very difficult. I have to say, we're looking at them here. It's, it, this wasn't just something you could do in 10 minutes. So we have some freebies to give away. Michael can do it a little electronic drawing of all those participants. So Michael, I'll let you do that right now. Absolutely. So hello again, everyone. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to announce the three winners of our participant gift card raffle. Um, and there will be two additional gift cards uh, raffled off based on the participant list, which I have taken. Um, so that will be given after the meeting. Um, so for our three winners, congratulations to Tripti Shuren, Gregory Paulin, and Abdelmanim Zayane. Congratulations. Awesome. And um, you will receive your link to your activated gift card within the next few business days. Um, congratulations again. And back to the discussion. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, we. what's next? You tell me. Let's go back to our list. Looks like some people voted for chest wall. I don't know. Yeah, like I like uh, I like I like chest wall. I think Sushil's comments are going to be really interesting to understand. You know, three D planning, VMAT, protons, where you start and stop. Uh, your wish is my command. Now we start to see red, which makes me happy. So I'll 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 tell you what. I'll do a quick flyby. Going from top to bottom, I'll let me, I'm kind of centering the views here. And as those of you watch the video of this, it'll kind of inform you when you log into Prono how you can do similar. I'm just gonna drag the mouse through the heart of the views. The three magenta contours are Aaron, Neil, and Rachel. And then the cloud is the population.
So who wants to make the first comment, question, or observation here? So since I, uh, if you look at the three expert contouring, and if you look at the medial and the lateral extent, probably that has the biggest impact in terms of dosimetry, in terms of lung dose and other dose. And that's what I was trying to say that as you move towards VMAT plan and a proton plan or a wide tangent plan, that could significantly increase the heart and the lung dose or significant variation in the heart and lung dose. I don't know, I don't know which is right or wrong, but those two centimeter medial and caudal extension, this is, these are the two biggest source of variation I see when I look at chest wall contouring. And the, and the second variation I see is whether to include ribs or not, because RTOG guidelines says include ribs in the intercostal muscle, but the recurrence pattern doesn't support that. And we wrote an editorial in that regard that probably the contouring should include skin and pec muscle. But it's very interesting. If you look at the European guidelines, they don't even include the pec muscle. And some of the intermediate guidelines they include the pec muscle. So there is so much variation out there in the international contouring guideline from including intercostal muscle to including pec muscle to only including the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So I think it, this reflects the international practice pattern to some extent. Yeah, I, I agree with Shashil's comments. The, the lateral and posterior aspect of it is really going to change what the angle of your tangent is, particularly inferiorly. So if people are scooping all the way back, um, you're going to get a really deep tangent and high lung dose. In regards to the, the chest wall, the, the European contours, uh, the European guideline paper was really interesting. Helped me understand, again, regarding those, those patterns of chest wall recurrence. They only include them, I think, if there was frank chest wall invasion. So T4 disease, they'll say, then you go and go ahead and include the chest wall. Um, uh, as in our practice, we've chosen not to do, uh, not to include the ribs in the chest wall um, uh, for really any patient. Um, we do include um, the muscle, but mostly for convenience of contouring. We do the same. We also include skin subcutaneous and fat muscle, no intercostal muscle, no ribs. What about the other other people in the panel or the moderate? What what do the other people do? So I think um, my practice is really similar to the both of you in that we don't routinely contour the the chest wall, um, and I think that makes a tremendous amount of sense in the absence of direct invasion, just because from you know first principles, if you're undergoing a mastectomy and they take the deep fascia and it's negative, then the likelihood of um, invasive disease into the pec muscle or into the chest wall is highly unlikely. Um, I think Neil's point is a good one though, which is that we know that there are lymphatics that are deep to the pec muscle that um, are contiguous with um, the axilla. And so then the question becomes, if you're going to use the estro guidelines where they contour on top of the pec muscle, where do you stop your axillary contours and start your chest wall contours without concern for missing any of those deep lymphatics. And I think um, that can be a challenge. So I think as a practice, we often will include the pec muscle um, because then we're not so concerned about avoiding or missing any of those deep lymphatics. I think that it, this, is a, this is an interesting case because um, the three of you almost kind of represent the whole population here where we have in this case we see the, you know if you look and see where the, the the color burst happens you can see that we actually had that variation just amongst three so maybe but how do thing, we define that lateral margin i think yeah. that's a good point of well, yeah. in, in that regard, I think the clinical call is most important call. Like, you know, when you're looking through the location of the tumor, looking at this through the scar and using a, a, a judgment call, because I don't think there is an anatomical landmark for, and for medial, they say just be short of midline so that people are, are more consistent in the mid, midline. But the lateral one, you know, like, for example, this is going almost up to the subscapularis. And I do see this happening. And when, as we were discussing, as you do VMAT or other plan, or if you're trying to treat with tangent, then you end up treating with much wider tangent. So the lung and the heart does, does go up. Yeah, I think it depends, uh, like uh, going with Shashil's point, depends on how, what kind of technique you're going to use and, and how do you contour. So if you if you came up in 2D, uh, you know, or, or, you know, early 3D, you know, you, you may want to contour based on what you think you know what your tangent's going to be. So you're kind of uh, contour optimizing before your tangent goes on. But if we know that we're going to do a more conformal plan, if we're going to use protons, 
we contour kind of differently. So clinically, you can take your inferior border even, it's supposed to be one and a half, two centimeters below the contralateral breast, but you don't really have a, you know, an, a solid landmark of where we're even to stop inferiorly. Um, uh, classically, I think it's, it's really just the exit and the entrance is at the mid axilla for what you would clinically set up your, you know, say your 2D tangent to be. Um, we've just chosen to use that because, but again, we reverse engineer based on what we think our tangent is going to be. I think some of the contouring guidelines do suggest that you should stop your breast or chest wall CTV um, at the latissimus, the anterior border of latissimus. And so some people do contour very far back um, because it is suggested in some of those guidelines. Um, but I, I do think that the estro guidelines, particularly if people have reviewed the reconstruction guidelines, they actually have a very truncated chest wall laterally and medially. So they suggest that the CTV of the chest wall should not exceed beyond the, um, much beyond the lateral or medial margin of the implant or reconstruction. So it actually is a much smaller CTV target than what we typically think of as a, a flat chest wall. And, and, and as we discussed the nodal content, same holds true for the European guideline for nodes. For intermediate risk, the volumes are much more truncated. And that will take some change in practice pattern for all of us in terms of changing it. But if you look at the nodal content, which we'll discuss next, has the same issue. But overall, I think there is a clinical judgment involved. There is no anatomical landmark. And, and as Rachel pointed out, people do go up to latissimus dorsi, but that does bring the target far too posterior in my mind. And the recurrence pattern doesn't support that unless the disease is in that quadrant or that part lateral. I have a question for the uh, for the group. Um, do you all cover the entire mastectomy scar? So we we do if it's feasible, but if it wraps all the way around the back, we don't. What do you all do? So in in, in situation where they do latissimus dorsi, sometimes you know to cover the flap, they bring the muscle from the back. Then the mm -hmm. scar is too far posterior. Yeah, I don't. But normally we try to do for inflammatory breast cancer. I would I would make sure it doesn't matter where the scar is. I would include it. For so-called intermediate risk, if it is becoming too far lateral and medial, then sometimes may or may not include it. But for most practical purposes, we try to include it. Yeah. What about you, Rachel? So I often look at the location of the original primary, um, as well as whether patients had dermal lymphatic invasion, and essentially try to recreate in my mind where I think the mastectomy was removing tumor from and where they would have approximated skin. So if the um, mastectomy scar far exceeds what we would typically think the bounds of our chest wall CTV to be, sometimes they'll cross over to the opposite side, sometimes they'll wrap around to the back. Um, in that case, I don't typically chase it, but I do try to be mindful of where the primary was. So if it was very medial, then I might cross midline to ensure that I'm getting a little bit of a margin on the area where the primary tumor was. Um, but it would be unusual for people to have cancers that are so far back along the mid axillary line. And so I tend not to chase that. So there's a, my simple mind is kind of just listening and out of amazement. There is so much art still in this if, 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 where, uh, if, even if the three of you had a perfectly conformal VMAT plan you did for this, they would be quite different than each other's just because of your blueprint is different. One question I'm thinking, if everyone had, had like, was there, it was there a library of data that we also could have supplemented with that maybe would have driven some more variation out? Or is this is what we're seeing purely the, the lay of the land now in terms of opinion? And if so, it is in, uh, indicative of, uh, of an art where, you know, there's maybe no right, wrong answer. We're still kind of developing. And I think that's where we want to go with C3RO is drive towards a consensus because can they all be the same? Uh, you know, are they all equal in terms of the quality of the treatment plan? That depends on the contours. Some of these may be a rhetorical questions, but I think they're important questions. I mean, it do bring an important point. It is, a, it is a art to a significant extent and that it does have impact in lung and heart dose. And the other thing which is reflecting and uh, the panel can also talk about it, the chest wall contouring has come up more in the last few years. So all these years, most of us who have been practicing 
but not routinely contouring chest wall. So in that regard, you know, the consistency of chest wall contouring will take time to be uh, uh, honed up and, uh, and be consistent just because people are not used to contouring chest wall. I mean, unless patients on the protocol are you looking at specifically, a lot of times people don't contour chest wall for a routine tangent beam. Like what about the other people in the, in the panel or, or, or what do they do? Like, I routinely don't contour chest wall for a 3D plan because uh, uh, unless I'm looking for specific things. Uh, we we routinely contour everything, but uh, you know, in in training we 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 didn't for routine uh, plans. Uh, so your point, it's probably not critical for for many cases. But our our practice um, since is, you know moved from uh, 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 moved entirely to contouring everything. So we do see wide variation um, amongst all the physicians, um, main campus and in, in our networks. A lot of opportunity to keep learning together. I think looking at pictures like this, I think it's you, so far, I don't know, session number one, interesting for the panelists and moderators. Are we? So Ben, I was just going to say, you know, we, we've already come up to an hour. Um, Structures to look at. So um, much we, to go, but I don't want to keep people. Do we have, do we want to, where do I'd we want like to go? To I'd like to stay and see the IMN contours. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think what let's, we should let's do, do IMNs and call it. <laughs> let's do IMNs. All right. So here we are. Let me do everything. This is visually better. Again, there's no red, but again, it's it's that same kind of structure that's small where. Uh, but here it looks like the variation is less. So let me turn the the ex the uh, the panelists. Where are you? Boom, boom, boom. Uh, again, I think we're looking superior and inferior is where there is a, the gradient is not steep at all, meaning the variation is very high, even if, even uh, from the ones that are here today, we have, I don't know, we can kind of toggle on and off and you can see how you were each different. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are several different guidelines. There's the, the RTOG kind of just says contour the vessel. The, uh, the rad comp atlas indicates include the vessel, a little space lateral, but all the way to the sternum. And then your estro guidelines say it's a five millimeter brush around the vessels in the, in the, in the fat spaces. There's, there's variability, certainly. I think it also depends on how you want to plan and treat. So if you're just, you know, want to include the IMNs and you're doing it R2G style, at least you can see it, eyeball it, include it. But if you're doing volumetric based planning, I think it matters a lot. For, for VMAT and for, for proton planning. So I actually think it matters a lot for 3D as well. <laughs> um, because when people are, I often say to my residents, don't be so cute about drawing your, your IMN CTV because the lateral margin and the medial margin of the IMN really do guide where you put your tangent field. So if you are very, very tight on your IMNs and you're just contouring the vessel, then you may be missing the fat space medially by the sternum. And we know that IMN recurrences can happen on either side of the vessel. So I think it's actually quite important that when people contour the IMN, that they are not contouring just the vessel, um, particularly if they're using 3D because with 3D, they could easily cheat on their tangent fields. And we, we know that so many people place the tangent field right on the edge of where they've contoured the IMN. And then by definition, it's only getting 50% of the dose. So if we actually do wanna comprehensively cover the IMN, if the patient's a high-risk patient, then making sure that we've got a margin around that IMN vessel, um, I think is gonna be invaluable for putting, placing your tangents. So, so Rachel, what, what, like even the margin uh, definition in the literature varies from three millimeter to five millimeters. What margin do you get? Um, so I actually contoured the entire fat space. So in some, in some circumstances, it's very narrow. In other places, it's wider. It really depends on the patient and their anatomy um, because you can often see um, essentially that potential fat space within, within the patient. So you can see the vessel and then you can see that there may be more potential fat space laterally or medially. And I, I try to contour much of that. Neil, what about you? How much margin do you give? Um, I usually use a five millimeter brush, but include the entire fat space, uh, medial and lateral. Um, uh, you, we do a ton of rad comp patients. So, so rad comp has kind of been 
uh, has become the de facto style. Like Rachel said, we use margins to make sure people aren't, aren't routinely cheating or underdosing. You know, the, what about you, Shashil? So it, it brings up the important point. The RTOG Atlas was the vessel, but the, the nodal uh, location atlases which have come out have shown that to get more than 90 to 95% of the nodes, you need to have close to five millimeter margin. So I give four to five millimeter margin, but more in, the most important variation which I do, which compared to what the atlases have, is the superior extent. In the RADCOM atlas, they go up to the drainage of the IM to the brachiocaphalic, which is very superior, like this one. I don't go that far superior because it's too hard to cover that and we do not have any outcome data to support that. So the RADCOM atlas does have this thing where you, know, you follow the IM vessel and you go up to the brachiocaphalic, which is some people have done it. When I contoured this one, I did not go up to that level because I feel it is too far superior. It's hard to cover on 3D and proton therapy, maybe it can be covered. And the, unless patient has IM node involvement, I do not go up to the drainage of the IM vessel to the brachiocephalic, which some people have done it. So that reflects a variation in the superior extent, which Ben is seeing it. I only go to top three intercostal space and I do not go up to the drainage of uh, to the brachiocephalic. Yeah, I think there's a big difference in terms of the IM and CTB on the traditional RTOG breast atlas and what we see in RADCOMP. And when we were developing the RADCOMP atlas, our thought was that, you know, lymphatics are contiguous, they don't stop and start. And so we felt like being able to be contiguous with the supraclavicular um, CTV made a lot of sense to us practically. But Sushil, I completely agree with you. If you're using 3D, then um, the upper part of the IMN is often too deep to encompass in either the supraclavicular, um, the MAO field or your tangent field. And so the coverage actually looks very poor when you, when you look at your DBH. Um, but for, for VMAT and protons, it then is, is um, something that we definitely look at from a volumetric coverage standpoint. Yeah, it's, it also, the, the, the beam ends up crossing over midline and it becomes kind of disconcerting to patients, especially darker pigmented patients, because they'll see an obvious thing that goes on the other side. It's usually like three to four centimeters across the other side too, and they hate it. Erin, what do you do? Like, what do you do in your practice? You go that far superior up to the drainage, unless if the patient is not in proton protocol? We, well, if you're doing 3D, you, you can't necessarily cover it. So you might contour it, but not cover the very top, but I will contour and connect the volumes for the reasons that Rachel kind of mentioned that theoret. I mean, and, you know, Simon Powell will say, you know, that you do in these recurrence atlases, a lot of those recurrences happen high and they, you know, they're sort of at the first inner space, but you know, there's some above it too. So like, it's certainly an area that's at risk and it's out of convenience that we don't contour it. Um, but there's also some concern that, um, you know, there was that JCO paper by uh, Taylor, like EBC TCG analysis, meta-analysis that suggested, you know, esophageal cancer rates are actually higher for patients that get radiation and like treating the IMNs um, certainly gets you even at that space, it gets you a little bit closer to the esophagus. And you see that when you contour aggressively, all, you know, to connect them that you're getting, you're getting pretty medial. So it's an interesting, you know, what is the right answer and what's best for the patient? I don't, you know, hard to say. So that, so Ben, that answers the question. Like we have four people and four are not agreeing with each other. So I think but, that reflects, that reflects why the superior border is so variable in the, in the contouring. Yeah, but I, 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 I like it because it reflects why we're doing this. I think we have to talk about these things. Of, of the, if I just kind of gauge the, the pictures here, the three that I'm showing, um, I'd say in, a, in an axial sense, Aaron was most conservative. You see hers is usually the largest contour on any slice. But in a superior inferior sense, it was Rachel who was most conservative, going by far the most um, inferior and uh, then kind of agreeing. And then Neil was, I guess, as Rachel would say, the cutest. He did, he, he got cute with it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it's, it's the smallest in the axial sense uh, and then also in the length. So I think, how do we, so I know there's other structures here. I think people now they can go in uh, um, and know how to explore this on their own time. Is there a question about how, what determines what's right or not? Is that, 
clinical trials and actual outcomes data? Because it's if so, we really have to pour over outcomes data and say, what if we had contoured this, this, or this and examined those DVHs? Are what's what's your thinking there on driving towards a consensus? We are recognizing variability here. Over time, we would like to drive towards consensus. I mean, William Edwards Deming would say variation is is always bad when you're manufacturing things. And what we are doing is manufacturing very highly conformal dose distributions to patients. So what things that as an industry can we do to drive towards a consensus after, after studying it, what can we do? I wish we had the answer because it is too hard to, like, you know, in the clinical trial, the benefit of region low radiation therapy in terms of absolute risk of local region relapse is so small to show in any outcome analysis would be a challenge very, very challenging. So I think we have to accept the variation, no doubt about that, but that variation has to be within the realms of what is published out there. We will not be able to reach a 100% consensus just because the outcome data would be too hard to establish any one of the things which we normally see. Because these are adjuvant treatment, these are not gross disease where you see the recurrence and you can establish it. Yeah, I agree with uh, Sushil. It's, it's, it'll be really hard to difficult to show in effect. Um, I think one strategy that's really great is I like, uh, I really look like looking at uh, nodal patterns of recurrence um, mapping and atlases. I think it provides a lot of really interesting real world information about where these actual nodes are. I think that's a great tool to continue guide further refinement as we get more data. And I think ultimately there are so many trials, particularly in the breast space that really try to tease apart the minutiae of um, including the IMNs in the superclav versus not. Um, and there's so many trials um, that have shown that data, but so much of the data is in the eye of the beholder and how they interpret it and how they interpret it for the patient that's in front of them. So to Suchil's point, you know, the, in, the involvement or including the regional nodes, we can show a small improvement um, in distant metastasis-free survival and disease-free survival. Um, but I think we're always trying to weigh what's the benefit to the patient right in front of me? And are they the person that I think is gonna benefit from that addition or do I not? Um, and I think that's where all the data in the world is still going to um, cause us to have some discrepancies in terms of consensus. But I think that what's heartening actually is to look at these contours and see that um, amongst Neil, Aaron and I, there's actually a, a tremendous amount of consensus about where the IMN contours start and stop. Um, and even though we're not seeing that the map looks like 100%, I think the, the general gestalt of where they're overlapping is actually very similar. Um, and I would wager that if we had done the same study a decade ago, that there had been far more variability. So I think we're spiraling towards more consensus, even if there's going to be some discrepancies between providers. Yeah, I think, you know, we got about a two and a half centimeter difference of opinion that's the gradient length, but also happens to be just of the, of the three contours I'm showing in the inferior direction and about two centimeters. So that's, these are things we should continue talking about because if we can't reach, one reason I think studying consensus is important to drive out variation as much as possible. We have to recognize it's an art and maybe we don't know the right answer yet, but we can focus in and get closer and closer to the right answer. We have to have that our goal because the inertia towards automation is almost unstoppable at this point. And I don't want technology developers and vendors to think that automation is the answer to everything when really it's these core questions, in my opinion, that are probably the most important questions to be asking in our field, which to me is exciting because it means it's that it's the experience, it's the outcomes, it's the art that we need to be talking about more. We can always teach a machine to reproduce what any individual does, but but then it's, it'll only reproduce that. So we do have to be thinking about ultimately what's, what's better and what's right. And I think if we continue thinking about how do we determine what's better and what's right, then we're headed in the right direction. So uh, studying variation is a great place to start on that. I appreciate everyone's time. I know I went over, I had fun. Um, we're gonna continue doing this. This is only the beginning. Before we go, I think we have another drawing, Michael. Can we give away some more free stuff? <laughs> Yes, we certainly can. So um, among the attendees, congratulations to 
pulling it up now. Drum roll, please. Uh, Mohammed Ben Saud and Francisco Javier Mobilia. Congratulations awesome. to you both. Well, thanks for your time. Are any parting remarks from from any of you? The floor is yours. Well, my depart, <laughs> departing remark is to uh, keep a lookout. We'll be doing the next month um, a sarcoma case um, led by uh, Matt Spraker uh, from Wash U. So I think it'll be an exciting um, extremity sarcoma. So um, keep a lookout for that. We'll send emails and Twitter announcements and um, please, please provide us feedback either at support at econtour.org um, how we can make this session better, higher yield for all of you. And thanks again for participating. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.